Okay, um, welcome back everyone. Uh, so, last week I started introducing, or started speaking about the question, what is art? Um, which is one of the central questions of aesthetics, certainly in the 20th century. Uh, I didn't get all that far. I said something about uh, 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 why this is an important question, uh, in particular uh, the radical changes which occurred in the arts in the 20th century, which led to uh, 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 a feeling of urgency to work out what exactly does count as art and what doesn't. Um, and then I, I concluded, well, I spoke for some time about the ancient theory uh, according to which art is a form of imitation or mimesis, uh, a theory which at least appears to be endorsed in some sense by Plato and Aristotle uh, and which continues to be very influential right up until the uh, 18th century and to some degree beyond. Um, right at the conclusion of uh, last week's lecture, I started talking about a second theory of art, which is the expression theory, or the, the uh, theory according to which art is not a form of imitation or mimesis, but a form of expression, usually expression of emotion. Um, so today, I'm just going to try to uh, present that theory, uh, and then two other theories of art, which uh, I suppose they're more recent historically, not that that's philosophically important. Uh, the expression theory is important in the 19th century and early 20th century. Then I'll talk about uh, the institutional theory, according to which a work of art is a work of art because of its relation to a, uh, a social institution known as the art world. And I'll, I'll finish by talking about the aesthetic theory, according to which a work of art is a work of art because of its aesthetic function. Uh, in the version of the theory I'll talk about because uh, 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 of the uh, aesthetic experiences which it might produce. Um, so, I, I think I finished last time. I, I, I had said of the expression theory um, that this appears, like the mimetic theory actually, to, to be an idea which first arose in discussions of poetry. Although, unlike the mimetic theory, these weren't discussions of poetry in the ancient world, these were discussions uh, in the 19th century, uh, primarily amongst romantic poets and uh, critics engaging with the rom romantic tradition. Uh, the most uh, important and famous of these was uh, uh, also the earliest, uh, of which I'm aware, Wordsworth's statement or claim in the uh, preface to Lyrical Ballads, uh, 1800, re revised 1802, that all good poetry is the spontaneous overflow of powerful emotions, or powerful feelings, I think he says. Uh, I gave you a different picture of Wordsworth last time, we've got a new one here. Uh, this is a, a, a famous portrait of Wordsworth by the English painter uh, Benjamin Robert Hayden. Uh, it, it's, uh, he's actually an interesting character in himself. I'll tell you an anecdote about him possibly at the end if we have time. Uh, Charles Dickens said he was a terrible painter, but Wordsworth quite like this picture. I think it's quite a good picture as well. It expresses his poetic character. Well, maybe it expresses it, maybe it imitates it. Um, uh, in any case, so uh, you, you might get a kind of uh, a caricature, romantic image of Wordsworth from that quotation, poetry is the spontaneous overflow of power, powerful feeling. He does go on to refine it uh, somewhat uh, later throughout the essay in the preface to uh, 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 Lyrical Ballads, and, and again I might say something else about that at the end, if there's time, but it's not of, of urgent importance. I also gave some other quotations last week, which I'll just, just remind us of. Uh, William Hazlitt uh, says that poetry is the language of the imagination and the passions. Thomas Hardy, poetry is emotion put into measure. Uh, A.E. Hausman says that uh, uh, the, uh, to th transfuse emotion, not to transmit thought, but to set up in the reader's sense a vibration corresponding to what was felt by the writer is the peculiar function of poetry, uh, to transfuse emotion, much like we do these days with blood. 
perhaps in those days, I think, probably not. I don't know. Uh, so this idea is prominent in the 19th century, from the beginning of the 19th century onwards, in these discussions. Uh, but it doesn't become a formal uh, a philosophical account of art in general, as opposed to a, a merely poetry, until towards the end of the 19th century. And uh, uh, a well-known early example of the expression theory of art uh, 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 in its more general form, of art in general, uh, appears in Leo Tolstoy's 1897 book entitled What is Art? Uh, this is the same Leo Tolstoy, of course, who wrote the uh, uh, famous novels and uh, uh, was in some sense the figurehead of a, a political or, or social movement. He also uh, uh, wrote this work of philosophical aesthetics. Um, and then later on, uh, the canonical version of the uh, uh, expressive theory, or at least what seems to be a canonical version, uh, uh, appears in the works of the uh, uh, Italian philosopher uh, Benedetto Croce and uh, uh, under his influence the English philosopher uh, Robin George Collingwood, often known as R.G. Collingwood. So I'll just go through these, these accounts uh, briefly. And there is an earlier one, by the way, uh, which is less discussed in, at least in English language philosophy, apart from as an influence on Tolstoy. This is uh, uh, Eugène Veron's uh, uh, 1882 uh, 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 expression theory in a work called uh, L'Esthétique, uh, but I shan't say anything about that. Um, so Tolstoy, in his work, What is Art, 1897, uh, emphasizes uh, the importance of art as a means of intercourse between persons. Um, sorry, I have a picture of Tolstoy. Too. There we go. Uh, so, the point of art on Tolstoy's view is to express emotions which are thereby communicated, uh, we might say following husband transfused, uh, to an audience. Uh, and communication here means that the audience must themselves feel the emotion uh, that was first felt and expressed by the artist. Uh, uh, so, so the same thing is felt either side by artist and audience. Um, uh, describing this idea, Tolstoy says, the activity of art is based on the fact that a man receiving through his sense or hearing or sight uh, another man's expression of feeling is capable of experiencing the emotion which moved the man who expressed it. Uh, and on the basis of this idea, Tolstoy says, it's slightly strange, the uh, syntax of translation, so I've paraphrased it. Uh, the activity of art is that of evoking in oneself a feeling one has experienced, and having done so, transmitting it to others by expressing it in movements, colours, sounds, or forms expressed in words. Um, it's actually very similar, uh, in many respects, that description to, to uh, the way words were explicates his idea in, in lyrical balance. Uh, there's one important feature of Tolstoy's definition of art uh, is that he understands it not merely as a description uh, of what art is, but also uh, as a theory of what makes art good. Uh, and he draws from this definition two criteria. Uh, so first, art considered as art, or, or qua art, if you like, uh, is good or bad simply in accordance with the degree of emotion communicated, how much emotion you manage to co communicate, or how much communicating of emotion you, imagine you uh, manage to do. Uh, however, with regard to its subject matter, Tolstoy says, uh, art is good or bad insofar as the feelings it communicates are conducive to the progress of humanity towards perfection. Uh, and he associates this with religion, and indeed, uh, with Christianity, or Tolstoy's view of Christianity. It was these kind of uh, ideas which led to him becoming the figurehead of a political social movement, Tol Tolstoyanism. Um, so Tolstoy goes on to argue, quite interestingly perhaps, 
that uh, the art of his day has become so obscure and unintelligible uh, that it cannot communicate emotions, and so it's no longer uh, uh, worthy to be called art. Uh, it's, it's only, he says, a mere, mere imitation of art for the purpose of pleasure. Uh, and he blames this on the professionalization of art in the 19th century. Uh, he, so the idea there is it's not meeting his first criterion. It's not expressing emotion at all. Um, he also ends up concluding that almost all of what society uh, at his time uh, considers art and good art, and indeed the whole of art, uh, is not really art at all, uh, on the grounds that it fails effectively to express emotions conducive to humanity's perfection. Tolstoy includes in this uh, uh, his great novels. Uh, he, 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 I think he allows himself some of his shorter folk tales uh, uh, to still count as art, but, but uh, it's a very revisionary theory. He, he wants to uh, 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 cast out the vast majority of uh, the Western artistic tradition on the grounds that it's not expressing emotions, or at least not of the right, right sort. Um, insofar as we're interested in Tolstoy's theory as a version of the expression theory, that might not interest us so much, uh, but it does illustrate um, two interesting features about the project of defining art. Uh, one is that Tolstoy seems to think that it's natural to include in his definition of art a normative compon component. Uh, uh, a component to do with what art should be or what makes art good. Other aestheticians uh, uh, don't do that. They say a definition of art should merely tell us what counts as art and should be completely silent on what art is good art if indeed there's a distinction between good and bad art. Uh, the second interesting feature of Tolstoy's definition uh, is that in allowing it to be so revisionary, uh, uh, Tolstoy transgresses what we might have thought uh, was an obvious rule to follow in trying to give a definition of art, i.e. to give a definition which covers all, or at least most, of the things we actually think are art. Um, sometimes this kind of criterion in philosophy is uh, described as uh, that of extensional adequacy. Uh, a definition of X should be adequate to the extension of X, that is, it should cover all the things that fall under the name X. Um, so Tolstoy uh, uh, completely flouts this principle. Uh, again, other aestheticians, uh, including one we'll look at, uh, uh, try to employ this principle. So there's a question here, uh, not merely about uh, conflicting theories of art, but conflicting uh, meta-theories about what we're doing when we try to give a, a theory of art. Um, that's all I'll say about Tolstoy. Uh, perhaps the most influential version of the expression theory is that uh, uh, given by Benedetto Croce uh, and R.G. Collingwood. Um, I say given by both of them, their theories are not exactly the same, there are differences between them, but they're sufficiently similar that they're sometimes referred to as the Croce-Collingwood theory, uh, and indeed uh, uh, Collingwood is very heavily influenced by Croce um, in, in his theory of art, so this makes some sense. I'll just explain who these people are, because they're not uh, 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 right in the mainstream of the history of philosophy, and you might not have heard of them, in particular uh, Croce. Um, I've got a picture of them. There we go. That's Croce on the left and Collingwood on the right. Uh, I, there's only two pictures of Collingwood online, and one he seems to still be in school, uh, but it's the, uh, the higher quality uh, picture uh, graphically. Um, so Benedetto Croce, he's a, an Italian idealist philosopher uh, uh, in the tradition of uh, German idealism, the tradition which uh, arose at the end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century, under the influence of, and partly as a reaction against, the philosophy of Kant. I idealism being roughly speaking, the view that uh, reality is uh, fundamentally mental or spiritual as opposed to uh, material or physical. Um, so he was, he was uh, also, he was extremely influential and famous in the first half of the 20th century uh, uh, as a philosopher, and, and indeed he was also quite important in Italian politics. Um, but 
for some reason in the second half of the 20th century, his fame evaporated. Uh, uh, and he's not well known today apart from where his name appears occasionally in aesthetics, in the history of aesthetics. Uh, R.G. Collingwood um, was an English philosopher and he was for some time the uh, Wayne Peake Professor of Metaphysical Philosophy here in Oxford. Uh, he was probably never as famous or uh, influential as Croce in his time, but neither did he, uh, neither was he reduced to a quite the same degree of obscurity. Uh, <laughs> Uh, in fact, one writer uh, described him because of his work in philosophy of history as uh, uh, possibly the best known neglected thinker of our time. Uh, and Collingwood, like Croce, was uh, working in the idealist tradition, the tradition of idealism influenced by German idealism. Um, so I'll just outline the main features of their account. I should warn you, it's, slightly, it's a slightly strange sounding account, uh, perhaps because we haven't been trained in the idealist tradition. Um, nonetheless, it's, it's very interesting. So, in 1902, Croce published a book which is usually known in English as Aesthetic, uh, which is the uh, uh, name of its English translation, which came out in 1908, uh, or 1909 possibly. Uh, and in that book, Croce distinguishes between intuitive or imaginative knowledge and logical or intellectual knowledge. Uh, and by intuitive knowledge, Croce has in mind here the Kantian idea of intuitions, which roughly speaking means something like uh, experience or perceptual experience uh, or sensation, but divorced from concepts. Uh, so it's, it's rather like actually the idea of Baumgarten makes central to his aesthetics, if you do remember lecture, lecture two, if that was two, uh, much earlier on. Uh, in any case, so Croce early on makes the rather surprising move of asserting that expression simply is intuitive knowledge. Uh, these are the same thing. And he accepts the uh, consequence of this that uh, if you cannot express a thought, then you don't really have it. Uh, for instance, uh, if you're not able to paint a picture, then to, to, to that degree you don't have the experience or the intuitive knowledge of the image you would paint. This is deeply counterintuitive, at least it seems so to most people. Uh, I've written a note here saying this seems crazy. Uh, uh, nonetheless, the croce to intuit is to express. And then he defines art as intuitive knowledge or expression. So you have three concepts in croce, it seems, uh, intuitive knowledge, expression, and art. And uh, he identifies all three of them with one another. Um, this is obviously quite a difficult idea to grasp, that intuition, that uh, intuitive experience, if you like, or intuitive knowledge, is expression. Uh, one way you might try to make it more uh, uh, comprehensible would be to suppose that for Croce, expression probably isn't a public thing. What he means is expression, but it might merely be a private thing that goes on uh, uh, just uh, on your own. Uh, it's not clear to me that that is what he thinks, unfortunately, and, and certainly Collingwood doesn't seem to think quite that. Uh, perhaps a Croce scholar could correct me on that. Um, in any case, Collingwood, in his 1938 book, The Principles of Art, uh, uh, outlines a very similar theory. Uh, Collingwood says that uh, artists create imaginative or imaginary experiences by which they express emotions. This is the main departure uh, from Croce in Collingwood uh, in his expression theory is that he puts a lot of emphasis on it being emotions which are expressed, whereas Croce has this broader idea of uh, it being intuitions or intuitive knowledge which is expressed. Um, I have seen one writer uh, try to uh, make quite little of this difference and say, well, Croce talks about feeling and he might mean the same thing as emotion here. Uh, other writers disagree with that. Um, and Collingwood, like Croce, seems to endorse the strange idea uh, according to which experience, or at least conscious experience uh, of the thing expressed, just is the expression. Uh, and he really does seem to mean public expression here, or, or articulation, something linguistic. Um, at least he seems to. Uh, so, 
Um, there's an often quoted passage of Collingwood which, which helps render some of these ideas at least a, a little bit more intuitive. Um, this is where he, he, Collingwood talks about what it is uh, or, or what it is like to express an emotion. And uh, he points out quite, quite uh, uh, perceptibly or intuitively uh, that one frequently starts when feeling an emotion in a state of perturbation or, or excitement uh, uh, of whose nature one is ignorant, right? Uh, I think he says, one wants to say, uh, uh, I feel, I don't know what I feel. Uh, so Collingwood says of someone in such a state that uh, from this helpless and oppressed condition, he extricates himself by doing something we call expressing himself. He expresses himself by speaking. The emotion expressed is an emotion of whose nature the person who feels it is no longer unconscious when he expresses it. Uh, as unexpressed, he feels it in what we call a helpless and oppressed way. As expressed, he feels it uh, in a way from which the sense of oppression has vanished. Uh, his mind is somehow lightened and eased. Um, at, at least I think that's quite an intuitive description of what it's like to express an emotion. Uh, once you articulate it, uh, in somehow the emotion seems to become uh, pellucidly present in a way it wasn't before it was, uh, uh, as Collingwood seems to say, uh, confused or unconscious, uh, and, and uh, by articulating or expressing it, you bring it into the light, uh, and perhaps in a sense into existence. Um, so you can get a sort of idea about why expression of an emotion and the mere feeling of emotion might be identified as the same phenomenon for Collingwood. Um, that still doesn't get us much closer to why art should be the same phenomenon as these things. Um, so I'll just say two things about, about how, how that theory looks when it results. One interesting feature of this theory, which is pointed out by both Croce and Collingwood, is that the expression theory on their view could be understood as a version of the mimesis theory, that art is imitation, uh, except that in this case, imitation is not merely of a table or a chair, uh, as it is in Plato's examples, uh, but of an emotion, as it is, interestingly, in, in, in it seems, others of Plato's examples. Um, I suggested last week that uh, when giving an answer to the question, what is art, what we ideally want are, are necessary and sufficient conditions for something to be a work of art. And we might think that uh, an obvious objection to the Croce-Collingwood theory, and indeed to the expression theory in general, is that this can't possibly give necessary and sufficient conditions because not every expression is a work of art, e even if every work of art involves expression. Now, somewhat interestingly, Croce and Collingwood uh, both bite this bullet, uh, and they insist that actually every instance of expression uh, including every sentence anyone utters, is a work of art. Um, so, for this reason, both Croce and Collingwood conclude that there's no real difference between art and language. Um, what this means is that Croce and Collingwood's theory of expression, or expression theory of art, rather like Tolstoy's, but in a different way, involves a pretty significant departure from our normal conception of art. Um, you might think that that's a prima facie criticism of this theory, or of these theories. Uh, however, it, it might not be a decisive criticism if it were to turn out that really there is only one phenomenon here, expression, uh, 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 experience of emotion, and art, and we're drawing arbitrary lines by distinguishing them, then, then you might say, well, the Crochet-Collingwood theory uh, is right, and we should replace our usual... Uh, accounts with it. Um, I suspect uh, 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 it would take rather a lot of argument to make that seem convincing. Um, I'll conclude the expression theory there. I did uh, uh, give with the uh, Mimesis theory a, a line from Shakespeare seeming to endorse it. So uh, to pull in another artist, if you go to the Ashmolean at the moment, you can see the works of Cezanne, some works. Uh, he himself endorses the expression theory uh, in a 1904 letter. He says, uh, for if uh, the strong experience of nature, and assuredly I have it, uh, is the necessary basis for all conception of art, 
on which rests the grandeur and beauty of all future work. Uh, nonetheless, the knowledge of the means of expressing our emotion is no less essential and is only to be acquired through ver very long experience. There you go. So here's a 17, uh, 1895 uh, still life by Suzanne uh, uh, with a curtain. Um, so uh, Croce and Collingwood, as I said, these are, these are philosophers writing in the idealist tradition uh, uh, under the influence of German idealism. For this reason, they belong in a way to a, a, an epoch in philosophy which has now passed uh, in the English-speaking world, uh, uh, certainly, um, or especially. Uh, so, with the rise of analytical philosophy in the early 20th century, uh, 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 either spearheaded by Russell and Moore uh, in England or by the Vienna Circle and Raver and such like uh, uh, on the continent, depending on where you locate the beginnings, uh, with the rise of analytical philosophy, you get, well, one thing you get is a de-emphasis of aesthetics itself. Uh, and therefore a, a, a kind of a break in accounts of art, or what art is. You also get the work of Wittgenstein, uh, which uh, led to quite a well-known uh, and important challenge to the idea that you could even provide a definition of art. Um, so I'll just quickly outline this before moving on to the theories that followed uh, uh, this stage chronologically, although that's not philosophically important, of course. Um, so there's a very frequently quoted passage of Wittgenstein's philosophical investigations uh, in which he considers the example of the concept of gains, or perhaps the word gain. Uh, and he asks whether there's any single feature common to everything that is rightly called a gain. Uh, and he concludes that there's no such feature uh, there are all sorts of things we call games, and not all of these involve uh, uh, players, not all of them involve, I don't know, balls, not all of them involve pieces, and so forth. Rather, there seems to be a crisscrossing or overlapping uh, web of features common to some games, not to others, without any of them occurring in every instance. Uh, and Moreover, the concept of game seems to be left open. Uh, that is to say, there's no predetermined boundary between what we can reasonably call a game and what we can't. Uh, all we can do is draw an arbitrary line if we want to, but there's no line waiting to be discovered. This appears to have been quite a significant uh, 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 development in philosophy. Previously, at least some philosophers uh, seem to assume that if a word makes sense at all, then it must be the case that there's something, some feature common to everything to which it applies. Uh, I, if you remember lecture two, we already came across something like this presupposition in Plato. Uh, the theory of the forms seems to be based on the assumption that uh, for every case of virtue, there's something the same. Uh, and for every case of the equal, there's something the same, for good, and so forth. Um, a, a very clear example of this assumption is in the very start of Clive Bell's 1914 work, Art, which I shan't talk about, but it's a, quite an important work in the history of uh, aesthetics. Uh, there he says um, something along the lines of, uh, if there isn't some one thing uh, belonging to everything we call art, then when we speak about art, we gibber. Uh, after Wittgenstein, people felt that this probably wasn't the case, and there's a classic 1956 article by the American aesthetician Morris Weitz, uh, spelled W-E-I-T-Z, uh, which uh, applies this Wittgensteinian insight to the notion of art in particular. And Weitz argues that uh, there's no single feature uh, or condition necessary for being a work of art. And he's helped along here, of course, by uh, uh, the avant-garde art of 20th century, which uh, uh, seems to exhibit no obvious common feature uh, to all works. Uh, uh, works like Duchamp's Fountain, which I spoke about last time, the urinal, which he signed with the words uh, uh, are mutt and exhibited or 
rather submitted to an exhibition and had it turned down, uh, but subsequently enshrined in the history of 20th century art. Um, so even White says being an artifact, being something in some sense produced by humans isn't necessary for being a work of art because he thinks you might take a, a, a rather nicely formed piece of driftwood and say this is a beautiful work of sculpture or a beautiful work of art. Uh, if that's correct, then it might be that attempting to find art is a, a, a project doomed to failure. Uh, this scepticism about the project of defining art nonetheless gave way uh, in the uh, mid to late 60s uh, to a new reinvigorated interest in the question uh, with the introduction of the very influential institutional theory of art, which is the uh, second one I'll, I'll outline today. Um, the institutional theory of art defines art in relation to an institution, which uh, goes by the name of an art world, or the art world. Uh, the art world itself is a notion which changes a bit over time. It means something like the uh, common and established practice of making works of art and uh, uh, displaying them, looking at them, this kind of thing. Whether it's the practice itself which constitutes the institution, or the people doing it, or the roles they play, is not always entirely clear, but uh, you can get a general idea and it only becomes important when you go into specifics, which one of these things it is. Uh, in any case, this notion was originally introduced in a 1964 uh, article by uh, Arthur Danto, American philosopher and art critic, uh, entitled The Art World. Um, so in that paper, Danto, uh, he draws our attention to works like Andy Warhol's Brillo Boxes, and uh, he points out that these Brillo boxes, made by Andy Warhol, are perceptually indistinguishable from real Brillo boxes. Uh, there is a difference. These ones are made of plywood, whereas uh, the real Brillo boxes are made of cardboard. But uh, Dante thinks quite plausibly that that's not going to account for the fact that these ones are works of art and the other ones aren't. It's certainly not going to account for the fact that these ones are worth thousands upon thousands of pounds, whereas normal Brillo boxes aren't and probably wouldn't be even if the Brillo company started making them out of plywood. Uh, so Danto suggests on these grounds that we're not going to find uh, in the intrinsic features of Brillo boxes, uh, Warhol's ones, the reason why they're a work of art rather than mere boxes. Uh, anyway, he doesn't make this argument quite explicitly. It's really implicit in his discussion. But uh, he concludes... Uh, uh, that the answer to why these are works of art must be in something intrinsic. He says, uh, to see something as art requires something the eye cannot decry, an atmosphere of artistic theory, a knowledge of the history of art, an art world. That's the uh, famous introduction of this term. Now, Dante, Danto doesn't... Dante doesn't either. <laughs> Danto doesn't uh, develop this, uh, these comments into a full articulated theory of art. Uh, however, the, uh, uh, another American aesthetician, George Dickey, uh, does do so uh, under the influence and inspiration of, of Arthur Dante. Um, so Dickey's aware that uh, uh, Whites has said we're never going to be able to get a definition of art for these Wittgensteinian reasons. Uh, art is what, what's called a family resemblance concept and so forth. Uh, Dickey's quite dismissive of that. He has a few complaints against uh, White's uh, article, which I won't go into. But in any case, having dismissed uh, 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 White's arguments, he develops what became a very influential uh, and in some respects perhaps controversial theory of what it is that makes things works of art based on Danto. Uh, he has three works at least. I mean, there's actually certainly some more, but perhaps three main works in which he develops this theory. There's a 1969 article called Defining Art. There's a, a book, 1974, entitled Art and the Aesthetic, colon, an Institutional Analysis. And finally, a 1984 book called The Art Circle. Um, these are all quite hard to get hold of in Oxford. You'll probably have to order them from Swindon or go to the Bodleian if you want to look at them. Uh, and Dickey's position develops over these. So 
I don't think it develops enough to, to be worth going into great detail here, but I'll, I'll just give the original theory and note how it does change. Um, so Dickey builds on Danto's argument that we have Brillo boxes which are indistinguishable from real Brillo boxes. What makes them art can't be anything intrinsic to them, so it must be something extrinsic. It must be an extrinsic framework in which they're situated in Dickey's terms. Um, depending on what a framework is, that might be a concept he smuggles in there in a way which doesn't obviously follow from the, from the argument. Uh, so what is that framework? Dickey thinks it's the art world. Um, in his first definition, attempted to find art, uh, from the 1969 paper, he says uh, there are two, two conditions for being a work of art. One, uh, to be a work of art, something has to be an artifact. And two, uh, in order to be a work of art, a thing uh, must be something upon which some society or subgroup of society has conferred the status of being a candidate for appreciation. Uh, by a candidate for appreciation there, Dickey insists that he doesn't mean anything particularly aesthetic, not, not aesthetic appreciation, not appreciation because of its beauty, just appreciation as in uh, 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 something which we might behold and consider valuable. Again, it's not clear whether he smuggles in notions he shouldn't be there or, or, or not. He thinks he isn't. Um, so the first component of Dickey's definition, uh, work of art must be an artifact, that just means it has to be something in some sense produced by a human or a person, perhaps. Martians can create art. Uh, this was the thing Morris Weitz was arguing against when he said, no, even a piece of driftwood can be a work of art. Dickey objects to that. He says, well, either when you say a piece of driftwood is a work of art, what you mean is it's beautiful like a work of art or you're, you're giving it some kind of evaluation, uh, uh, in which case it's not really a work of art, or it really is a work of art, in which case you've made it an artifact. Uh, okay, so he thinks uh, it's possible for, a, for a, a natural object, much like uh, uh, Duchamp's urinal to become a work of art uh, without it being altered in any intrinsic way. Uh, but in order to become a work of art, it also must become an artifact. Uh, in some sense, qua work of art, uh, the urinal, fountain, uh, or the driftwood uh, has been made by a person. Uh, obviously, that's quite a difficult uh, notion. Um, it's difficult to understand how that would be different from just allowing things which aren't artifacts to be works of art and eliminating that part of the definition. Uh, but you know, it's not so hard to understand, I suppose. Um, regarding the... Uh, uh, importantly there, Dickey reveals that he's keeping evaluative uh, 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 features, normative components out of his definition, unlike Tolstoy, as I mentioned earlier. Um, in, in relation to the second part of the definition, the really important part, uh, the bit about things having conferred on them uh, the status of being uh, candidates for appreciation. Uh, Dickey uh, says, what I want to suggest is that just as two persons can acquire the status of common law marriage within a legal system, so an artifact can acquire the status of a candidate for appreciation within the system Danto has called the art world. And that's quite a useful uh, explication because it uh, uh, brings in this familiar notion of uh, uh, the legal status of common law marriage. This appears not because you might think of any intrinsic properties of the people who are uh, 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 married, but because of the institution of the law uh, in which their marriage is situated. Um, <coughs> Dickey thinks that the uh, 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 situation, the, sorry, the uh, institution in which uh, uh, artworks are situated that makes them artworks is the art world and he, he, he makes this more explicit in the uh, second version of his definition uh, the 1974 one there he says one, a work of art must be an artifact and two uh, uh, it must be one a set of the aspects of which has had conferred upon it the status of candidate for appreciation by some person or persons acting on behalf of a certain social institution brackets the art world I don't know why he puts that in parentheses, the other one, uh, that, but it becomes incorporated into his definition. Uh, as an illustration of his idea, 
Dickies talks about works of art or paintings produced by chimpanzees. And he says, a painting produced by a chimpanzee, which is then hung up in a uh, zoological museum or a natural history museum as an example of the kind of things these creatures are capable of producing, would not be a work of art. However, if it's hung up in an art gallery, then it would be an, a work of art. Uh, it all depends on the institutional setting. Um, so here we have, this is Congo, the chimpanzee of London Zoo. Uh, this is probably the world's most famous chimpanzee painter. Uh, there was a large exhibition of Congo's work uh, at London's Institute of Contemporary Arts in 1957. Uh, in 2005, three of Congo's works uh, were sold or auctioned at a, 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 an auction alongside works by Warhol and Renoir. Warhol and Renoir's paintings went unbought, but Congo sold 14,000, almost 15,000 pounds. The Congo style has been identified as belonging to the tradition of abstract uh, impressionism, not abstract expressionism. These are distinct, that's a known tradition. There is an example of a yeah. painting by, yeah, it all becomes clear, doesn't it? Uh, this isn't actually the chimpanzee uh, Dickey has in mind. He has in mind a slightly lesser known chimpanzee painter, Betsy of Baltimore Zoo. Um, I don't know if one was an influence on the other. Uh, Dickey alters his theory, in any case, in 1984, in response to some criticisms. Uh, I, I won't have time to go into these. Uh, the main criticism uh, is put forward by Monroe Beardsley. He basically says that Dickey's definition requires people to be able to act on behalf of the art world, as though it were... Uh, an institution like a university or, or a museum or, or, or a church. However, it seems that the art world isn't really like one of these. Individual art museums might be, you can act on behalf of those, but the art world is this established practice in Beardsley's terms. He says it's a, uh, an institution type, not an institution token. Uh, uh, and Dickey accepts this criticism quite graciously. He says, uh, yeah, but this is true, you can't act on behalf of it. This was all far too formal. He revises the theory. Uh, so in 1984, he, he changes his definition of work of art to the following. He says, a work of art is an artifact of a kind created to be presented to what he calls an art world public. And uh, in order to explicate that definition, he has to give definitions of art, artist, public, art world system, and art world. Uh, he does this in a, an obviously circular way. He defines these in terms of one another and then argues, quite interestingly, that this circularity doesn't matter because what he's achieving is bringing out the structure uh, uh, of these things. In any case, in most respects, or at least in central and important respects, the 1984 theory uh, is like the uh, original theory in that it defines art in relation to the institution of the art world. A work of art is simply something which stands in the correct relation to that institution. Um, so, finally, I'll move on swiftly to uh, Monroe Beardsley's uh, theory of art. So we've done now, last week, the mimetic theory, art is imitation, the expression theory, art is expression, probably expression of motion, Dickey's institutional theory, theory. Uh, the fourth and final one I want to look at is the aesthetic theory. And I've got a picture to go with it. That's just Botticelli's Birth of Venus. Uh, it's a work of art which might have been created for aesthetic reasons because it's very beautiful. Um, so although there was a lull in aesthetic definitions of art or in philosophical attempts to define art uh, in the middle of the 20th century, this uh, uh, reappeared as a central project. I should say Dickey's isn't the only definition which, which uh, surfaced around this time. There's also a very important historical definition by someone called Gerald Levinson, which I won't talk about. There's also someone called uh, Timothy uh, Binkley, who just says anything's a work of art that's indexed as a work of art, which seems to mean anything someone says is a work of art is a work of art. Uh, 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 so, and that's actually, you know, in some respects quite similar to uh, uh, Dickey's theory, although uh, Dickey himself has some objections to putting it quite like that. I in any case, those uh, uh, definitions all share the feature of uh, uh, being quite open to the, uh, the avant-garde. They, they seem to try 
to incorporate into their definition everything which is actually being called a work of art at the time. Very unlike the definitions offered by Croce and Collingwood and Tolstoy, which uh, we've already discussed. Um, the aesthetic theory of art uh, is not like those in this respect. Um, it says that art is in some sense to be defined in relation to the aesthetic, by which uh, we mean what I called beauty in a broad sense in the earlier lectures. Uh, beauty taken to include the sublime and the pretty and the dainty and uh, uh, so forth, and possibly the opposites of these things, like the ugly. You might call those things aesthetic as well, but negatively aesthetic. If you um, so I, I think it's worth saying of this uh, of the aesthetic account of art, although it doesn't seem to be given a rigorous philosophical uh, exposition and defence until the work of uh, 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 Monroe Beardsley in the late 20th century, um, there's a clear sense in which this, this account of art is presupposed, uh, perhaps presupposed so widely that it never seemed necessary to give it a philosophical exposition, for a long time previous um, it's not clear quite how long previous. I think there seemed to be evidence of this presupposition in Plato's Republic. Um, Tolstoy, in the book I've already mentioned, What is Art, attributes this view to every aesthetician uh, from Baumgarten to the time at which he's writing. That's probably a bit cavalier, but uh, not entirely false. Uh, there's also a very important paper by someone called John Passmore called The, uh, the Dreariness of Aesthetics, which... Uh, 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 mentions that this is the uh, standardly held view. So it's by no means a new idea Beardsley is introducing. Um, we only have a couple of minutes, really, so I'll just very quickly summarise Beardsley's main ideas. Um, Beardsley's extremely important philosopher of the 20th century in aesthetics. He has a book called... Uh, 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 problems in the philosophy of criticism, which came out in the middle of the century and really started analytical aesthetics or aesthetics in the analytical tradition. But it's not until quite late on, 1982, that his book, The Aesthetic Point of View, comes out and he addresses the question, what is art? Before then, he avoids it. Um, so Beardsley has some methodological differences uh, uh, with, or disagreements with uh, Dickey and Danto. Uh, Although he's not as revisionary as Tolstoy, uh, Beardsley emphasizes that extensional adequacy, as I called it, shouldn't be the only virtue we're looking to achieve when we give a definition uh, as part of uh, our philosophical theorizing. Uh, he says, well, it's, it's good to try and match uh, uh, everyday uses of a term to uh, whatever degree we can, but we need to balance this virtue against that of uh, coming up with a theoretically significant definition, i.e. a definition uh, which brings out uh, a genuinely interesting uh, genus of things uh, rather than some arbitrary selection. Uh, and he seems to have the impression that, that the problem with Dickey's theory and certainly of uh, uh, Binkley's is precisely that, that on these theories art could be just anything and it's not very philosophically interesting. Um, so, on these grounds, Beardsley suggests that an artwork is either an arrangement of conditions intended to be capable of affording an experience with marked aesthetic character, or, incidentally, an arrangement belonging to a class or type of arrangements that is typically intended to have this capacity. What that means is, uh, if I want to create a work of art, I can create, say, a landscape painting, that's a work of art anyway, because landscape paintings typically are created to be aesthetically pleasing or to give people an aesthetic experience. On the other hand, if I create something which doesn't belong to a class like landscape paintings, which are usually made for that purpose, if I create a novel object, or perhaps not a novel object, but an object that just doesn't belong to one of those classes, a computer keyboard or a lectern or something perhaps, then I need to have the intention of making it something that will afford aesthetic experiences. Um, that's a very quick uh, exposition of Beardsley's theory. Uh, it's probably best not to attempt to go into it anymore now. I'll just quickly summarise. So we've had four theories of what art is. The mimetic theory, art is uh, imitation or, or representation of things. 
The expression theory uh, is an expression of uh, intuitive knowledge for Crochet or emotion uh, for Tolstoy and uh, Collingwood. Uh, the uh, institutional theory art is defined by its relation to a social institution, the art world, which seems to be a, a, a practice or set of practices uh, uh, of producing works of art and viewing them. And finally, the aesthetic definition, uh, uh, which appears to have been nascent in philosophical thought about art for many centuries, but only uh, gives, is given a rigorous exposition and defense in Beardsley's 1982 work, uh, which says that art is uh, uh, anything created with the intention of affording aesthetic experiences or anything created that belongs to a type of thing usually created with that intention. Okay, that'll be enough for today. Thank you. Yeah. 